Good evening. Please take your seats. Good evening. Oh, I would like more excitement. Good evening. Okay. It is my great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce Dr. Kip Thorne this evening, a world-renowned theoretical physicist and a good friend. I would like, before I introduce him, in fact, to also introduce his wife, Dr. Carolee Winston. Carolee, please stand. Carolee is a professor at USC in Los Angeles, uh, specialized in neurorehabilitation, and tomorrow she will be giving a lecture at King Abdulaziz University. It's great to have you here. Kip has spent most of his career at Caltech. Although he technically retired a few years ago as the Richard Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics Emeritus, he remains very active in research and, as you will find out today, as a Hollywood celebrity. You see, they, they react more to the Hollywood part than the research part. <laughs> it's a research university here, remember that. He is one of the most foremost experts on Einstein's theory of general relativity, and he proposed the Hoop conjecture, which describes the conditions under which an imploding star will turn into a black hole. I believe that he and Dr. Stephen Hawking are the two most influential scientists in this area over the past 50 years. He's received, he received his bachelor degree from Caltech and his PhD from Princeton University. He was a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, a Fulbright Fellow, and he has received numerous prestigious awards, including receiving the Einstein Medal and being elected to the Russian Academy of Scientists and the US National Academy of Sciences. Kip was a visionary person behind the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory called LIGO. It is the largest scientific project ever funded by the US National Science Foundation. Currently, over 1,000 researchers worldwide are involved in the project to detect, to detect gravi gravitational waves that are predicted by Einstein's theory. I could go on and on outlining his many great scientific accomplishments, but tonight the focus is not only on Kip as a scientist, but also as a communicator of science. In 1973, he co-authored the classical textbook, Gravitation. I should mention it is one of the largest books in the history of the world, I think uh, if you look at Wikipedia, they say 1,200 pages. I believe you told me it is 1,304, the exact number, so significant book on gravity. And later, he proceeded to write a book for non-scientists titled Black Holes and Scientists, colon, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy. His interest in scientific communication extended to PCs in Scientific American and Collier's Encyclopedia. But a number of years ago, he decided to do much more than that, and he started developing a story for a science fiction movie centered around the theory of general relativity, a movie grounded in science that would make people dream about science. This movie, Interstellar, was released in 2014 and was one of the blockbuster movies for that year. It is interesting that the same year, 2014, another movie where Kip also played a role was released, The Theory of Everything, a movie about the life of Stephen Hawking. I mentioned Hawking's name earlier, but did not tell you that he and Kip have been close friends and collaborators for about 50 years. In The Theory of Everything, the actor Enzo Clienti, Silanti, plays the role of Kip Thorne, one of the characters in the movie. A few of you, quite a number of you, I hope, attending the viewing of Interstellar on Thursday evening. I am sure you enjoyed the remarks Kip made 
about the history of the movie and what it takes to navigate through the Hollywood scene. Tonight, you will hear about the science behind the movie. Dr. Keith Thorne is a world-renowned astrophysicist who wants the world to dream about science. It is an honor to have him here at KAUST. Please join me in welcoming him. I can see that uh, President Chameau has you very well trained. You were appropriately solemn when he talked about my research, and you laughed appropriately when he first introduced the, the topic of Hollywood. And so, uh, in fact, my role in Hollywood has been to try to uh, use Hollywood and the movie Interstellar to in get people interested, particularly young people, interested in science. And I think we've been very successful. Interstellar sold 100 million talk. Uh, uh, tickets around the world. I don't know any other way that a theoretical physicist could possibly have some impact on 100 million people except through Hollywood. Um, so I'm going to begin by very quickly going over the things that I said uh, at the beginning of the showing of Interstellar, uh, just as background, uh, but then I'm going to move quickly into the science of the movie itself. So the movie was started by Linda Obst and me. Linda uh, is a, a close friend of myself and my wife and a, a well-known producer in Hollywood. She telephoned me one day in 2005 and invited me to brainstorm with her uh, on ideas for a movie and very quickly we agreed that it would be a movie in which we would embed real physics, primarily the physics of Einstein's general relativity of warped space and time, into the fabric of the movie from the outset. And, uh, this makes it unique. I think I only know two other science fiction movies that uh, do anything similar. Uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, in which Arthur C. Clarke, as the physicist, worked uh, together with uh, Stanley Kubrick in order to uh, make this movie and embed sci real science into it. And Contact, in which Carl Sagan played the role that I play on Interstellar. And so with those as a challenge to try to match them, it was a daunting challenge, but a great pleasure working with people in Hollywood. Everybody that we worked with embraced the idea of a film with real science embedded into, in, in it in a very deep way. We brought on Jonathan, or Jonah Nolan, as the screenwriter, I should say Linda, uh, uh, and Steven Spielberg, who was working with us early on in the film, brought on jo uh, along Jonah. He wrote three drafts of the screenplay, but we would get together uh, every two or three weeks while he was writing at the faculty club at Caltech for a three-hour lunch, and we would brainstorm about the science in the movie. And so uh, he got the science embedded deeply in that way. Uh, his brother, Christopher Nolan, came on board a few years later as the director uh, and Emma Thomas, Chris's wife, is the uh, lead producer, uh, and together they were really responsible for making the movie take off and happen. Uh, at the beginning of my work with Chris, uh, which was uh, only about 18 months before the movie came out, this happened very quickly once Chris came on board, I ran past him a set of guidelines that I hoped that he would follow and everybody would follow in making this movie, that nothing in the movie will violate firmly established laws of physics or our firmly established knowledge of the universe, and that all the speculations about poorly understood physical issues, and there are a lot of such speculations in the film, uh, that they will all arise from real science and not just be created from the mind of the screenwriter. And Chris happily embraced these guidelines so long, he said, so long as they do not get in the way of making a great movie. And then the next thing he said to me was, and Kip, if you don't like what I do with the science, you don't have to defend me in public. So I was a little bit uneasy about that. But by the second meeting that we had together, we had come to understand each other very well, and we had, uh, it had become a brainstorming collaboration the same way as I had had with his brother. So Chris brainstormed with me through three more drafts of the screenplay. By the time he was finished, uh, he and his brother had changed the story in the screenplay almost completely, so this really is their story, not Linda's and mine. 
but they had preserved the science and the goal of embedding the science into the movie deeply. And we had generated a lot of new science for the movie through our collaborative brainstorming. So in the end, this is really the Nolan's movie, not Linda's and mine, but the Nolan's movie with our vision for the science uh, adopted and embraced by the Nolan's and embraced by everybody else we worked with, by Paul Franklin, who received the, uh, the Academy Award for the visual effects in the movie, uh, by the various actors in the film, Matthew McConaughey, who plays Cooper, Anne Hathaway, who plays Amelia Brand, uh, Michael Caine, who plays Amelia's father, Professor Brand, and Jessica Chastain, who plays Murphy Cooper. And I always like to emphasize that you have here Michael Caine, uh, one of the great actors of all time, Jessica Chastain, one of the most brilliant young actors. They are playing theoretical physicists. And uh, that's really wonderful. And uh, it's wonderful to see them embracing the idea of becoming theoretical physicists and working to to understand the mindset of a theoretical physicist in the process of uh, making the film. So with that background behind me, let me move on and talk about the science in the movie. The first piece of science in the movie has nothing to do with relativity. It's disaster on Earth. You see people burning their crops because the crops have diseases and the diseases are spreading, a disease that they call a blight. You see great sandstorms, uh, dust storms, and in this, uh, after the dust storm is over, you see the big piles of dust. Uh, the earth is dying, and it's dying for partly unspecified reasons, but the one that is really highlighted in the film is blight. Blight is basically a gener generic word for a disease uh, of plants that's ca caused by some sort of pathogen, some sort of organism that is killing the plants. Now, biologists tell me that uh, blights generally come in two types. There are, uh, sp there are specialist blights that attack just one kind of plant, but are extremely lethal. And it was such a specialist blight that wiped out the chestnut trees in the eastern United States uh, about the time I was uh, young and growing up. And then there are generalist blights that attack large numbers of plants but they are not all that lethal. They just make a lot of different kinds of plants rather sick. But nothing that we know about blights, I'm told by uh, my bi biologist friends, nothing that we know prevents there from being a generalist blight that is extremely lethal and evolves very fast. And that's the kind of uh, blight that occurs in the movie. In the process of planning for the movie, the idea of a blight of this sort actually came from Jonah Nolan, Christopher Nolan's brother. And uh, I was worried, is it conceivable that you have this kind of a blight? And so we had what we called at Caltech a blight dinner. Uh, we brought in four great Caltech biologists, uh, one who was a specialist in these kinds of diseases, uh, others who had other relevant specialties. Uh, we plied them with the best wine that they had at, at the faculty club. For three hours, we sat around drinking wine. Ex excuse me, I forget that I'm in Saudi Arabia. We, <laughs> we sat around <laughs> drinking wine and talking about the, what could go wrong with the earth biologically. Uh, and uh, by the time the evening was over, I was scared to death about all the things that could go wrong. <laughs> but one of them was the generalist, lethal, fast evolving blight which is what then Jonah put into the screenplay. Uh, there are a variety of other things that could have been responsible for the sad state of the earth at the beginning of the movie. Runaway climate change is one obvious one. And there are a number of others that I discuss in my book about the science of interstellar. And I should back up and remark on this book. Uh, once, the, they, uh, once the director was finished filming the movie and was beginning to edit it, I sat down and wrote, over a period of about five months, wrote a book about the science in the movie. This was a calm and relatively quiet period for me. I had uh, played a big role in the development of the screenplay. And I had worked very closely with the visual effects teams on the visualizations of black holes and wormholes and so forth. But that role was finished, and so I then sat down to write this book on the science of the movie. The book came out simultaneous with the movie, but we were not allowed to tell the world about this book or to promote it at all uh, before it came out. The reason was that people in the studios, and particularly the uh, lead producer, Christopher Nolan's wife, 
were scared that if people knew there was a book about the science of the movie, that would drive people away from the movie. That the, the movie would seem, in Emma Thomas's uh, words, it would seem too brainy. And, uh, and they would not sell 100 million t tickets around the world. Uh, and so we put the book out simultaneous with the movie, but had to have uh, some sort of media blitz with the help of the media to make people aware of it at the very, very last minute. And uh, the th a key thing about Christopher Nolan is that in general his films have uh, lots of hidden information that's very hard to follow. And there are pieces of this movie that probably left you a little bit puzzled. And uh, the role of my book is to answer those questions and explain what's going on. And that's the role of my lecture this evening. So one of the chapters in the book is about the blight and in more generally what may have happened to the earth to put it in such a, a sad state at the beginning of the movie. Now, the earth was in such a bad state that it was necessary, uh, the uh, people, uh, the scientists involved in the movie and the people at NASA uh, concluded it was necessary to move humanity off of earth and find a new home elsewhere in the universe. But there's a real problem with that. There is no hospitable planet except the Earth here in our solar system. Uh, and so they felt they had to go beyond the solar system. But the distances in the universe to get to other stars are enormous. So the sun is here. This is a three-dimensional map of the nearest stars. The nearest star is Proxima Centauri, which is in orbit around Alpha Centauri, or they're in orbit around each other. Uh, but the nearest star that has, we think, a habitable planet to which they uh, could go is Tau Ceti. The distance from the sun to Tau Ceti, Tau Ceti is about 12 light years. Now, that just doesn't sound like all that far when you say, well, it's only 12 light years. Uh, but you think about it. We humans, the, only, the farthest we've gone is to the moon. And if you think of going from here to Tau Ceti at 12 light years, it's like going halfway around the world. Then in going to the moon, we have gone a distance of seven centimeters. So that's the challenge. If in a period that is not far in the future, a century, a century and a half in the future when this movie occurs, uh, you wanted to go to Tau Ceti, it's pretty hopeless. Uh, the technology is not there. The technology is not going to be there in the next century. I do believe interstellar travel will come for humans, but it's going to take several centuries, even if we push very hard on the technology. It's, it's a very, very tough to build up from what's equivalent to seven centimeters to what's equivalent to halfway around the world. And so in the movie, we used a different device to do this. We used the wormhole. But in order to explain the wormhole, I have to explain another key idea that underlies this movie, and that's the idea of the fifth dimension. And in the film, you see a frequent discussion of the fifth dimension. And so let me count the dimensions that we have in our universe. We have three spatial dimensions. We have east, west, north, south, and up, down, all very familiar. Physicists think of time as being the fourth dimension. In order to tell your friends where to meet you. They have to say where in space, that's three dimensions, and when as well. So it takes four numbers to tell your friend where to meet you. And then in the movie there is one other big dimension which I would like to call out back, which you and I have never experienced. And in order to visualize that, I would like to think of our universe as being like this plane here, two-dimensional plane. I'm showing you north, south, east, west, and I have removed from the diagram up down so that I can put in out back. So we live in this two-dimensional surface, which is really three-dimensional, and out back is perpendicular to our universe, going out into what physicists call the bulk. So physicists use the phrase the bulk for this region that is above and below our universe, and the brain or membrane, that's short for membrane, two-dimensional surface, but really three-dimensional for our universe. And so the fifth dimension plays a big role in this film. Uh, but the fifth dimension is speculative. And so a key aspect of this film is it, it's a device also to uh, teach the readers of my book about the difference between speculative 
science and true science, where by true science I mean something that we're very confident of, we have a lot of experimental data, or uh, it's so firmly embedded in the laws of physics, which themselves are very well tested, that uh, we're sure we know what we're doing. Speculative science is in areas where we're not sure we know what it's doing. It is just beyond, by and large, just beyond the frontiers of knowledge. Not so far that we're totally at sea, totally uncertain about what happens, but far enough that we have to speculate to some degree. And the fifth dimension is speculative, so I put an S up here. In a few minutes, I'll get to things that are true, and I'll put a T up there and, uh, when I talk to them. I, I'll let you just peek up in the right-hand corner in order to see whether what I'm talking about is speculative or truth. So the wormhole was the device that is used in the film to go uh, from the Earth and our solar system to other habitable planets far beyond our solar system. Uh, we had a lot of wormholes in the apples in the trees where I grew up <coughs> in Logan, Utah, in the Rocky Mountains. <coughs> a wormhole is obviously <coughs> a hole that has been eaten through an apple by a worm. And if you're an ant and you live on that surface of the apple, the surface of the apple is your entire universe. It's your membrane or your brain. The interior of the apple is your uh, fifth dimension, if you wish. It is the additional dimension that goes beyond your universe. And so you have a choice if you want to go from up here to down there. You can go around on your universe or you can go through the wormhole to get there faster. And so the question, and so the interior of, of the apple is your bulk. Uh, it's the uh, higher dimension in which your universe lives. So this story is the same then for our own universe. Our universe, I show here again, is a two-dimensional surface, removing one of the dimensions. Uh, we're sitting out here in the solar system. The one mouth of the wormhole is here near Saturn. The other is in a very distant galaxy, 10 billion light years from Earth, unbelievable distance from Earth. However, what somehow nature has managed to do in the bulk is to bend our universe around so that, as seen through the bulk, the distance from Saturn to this distant galaxy is only about one kilometer, whereas it's a, a, a billion light years, or 10 billion light years going around uh, through the universe. And the wormhole, then, is the surface of this tube that leads you from the vicinity of Saturn into the distant galaxy. And this is explained in the film by the actor who plays Romilly. Romilly is the a uh, theoretical physicist who goes on the journey through the wormhole, he explains it by bending a sheet of paper around like that and sticking a pencil through it and saying that surface of that pencil is the wormhole. So this is the same thing as you saw in the film that Romilly did. Now, uh, for this movie, the agreement was that uh, everything that appeared in the movie in terms of wormholes and black holes and so forth would be as accurately depicted as possible. So we began by Eugenie von Tunzelman, who was uh, the lead artist on the film at the double negative uh, 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 visual effects uh, company in London. Uh, Eugenie and her team created paintings of the stars and galaxies and dust clouds in, the, uh, in this very distant galaxy. Then uh, I... Uh, derived, gave them the equations for the propagation of light from this galaxy through the wormhole up to a camera. And uh, then Oliver James, who is the uh, chief scientist at Double Negative, Oliver uh, programmed those equations uh, on a supercomputer using the C++ programming language, integrated it into the uh, software that they already had at Double Negative, in order to make the images by solving the Einstein's equations that I had given to him for the propagation of light through the wormhole in order to see just what this alien galaxy would look like to the camera that is up, uh, up there near uh, Saturn. And the result is this. So here you see the camera. It's looking off to the side at Saturn, and it's looking through the wormhole at the distant galaxy. That's then the light that came, comes through the wormhole is inside this circle. Uh, the circle, what it really is, it's, it's the surface of a sphere, and it looks very much like a crystal ball. And looking into it, you see 
the light coming from the stars and nebulae of that distant galaxy as though that galaxy were in the interior of the uh, crystal ball, in the interior of the wormhole. Uh, but then off, off to the side you see uh, the planet Saturn. And so this was a, the image that was generated in that way, one of the images, and all of the subsequent images are as they really would be, as seen by a camera uh, up near the wormhole. So I'm now going to show you the trip through the wormhole as it came out of these simulations on a supercomputer. Uh, this is not the version of the trip that you see in the movie, uh, for those of you who have seen the movie. It's a little different. Uh, I begin this one just by placing the wormhole. Uh, it's very close to us, and Saturn is in the background. The wormhole looks big, almost as big as Saturn, but it's really only two kilometers across. It's just that it's quite close to you, and Saturn is much farther away. Uh, the light from Saturn comes, some of the light comes around this side and makes this distorted image, but a little bit of the light goes around the other side of uh, the wormhole and makes that image. So that's a highly distorted image, a secondary image of Saturn on the other side. This is what's called gravitational lensing, the distortion of an image uh, by the bending of light around the wormhole. It's uh, rather like the distortion of the image that you have if you go into a room with a curved mirror or in, a, in uh, the fun houses, as we call them, that I grew up with in the United States. So we're going to go into the wormhole from the vicinity of Saturn into the a distant galaxy. And so we watch as we are plunging down toward the wormhole. Saturn, of course, looks like it's pushed off to the side. It's just that you're getting closer and closer to the wormhole. And that's the light in, from the distant galaxy. We're about to enter the wormhole. We've just entered it. We're now through it, and we're in the distant galaxy. And wasn't that an exciting trip? <laughs> so um, Christopher Nolan called me up one day when I was in the process of writing my book. I thought we were all finished. He said, we have a problem. He said, would you come to my house? We need to talk about this. And so he, I went to his house. He showed me, uh, not precisely this movie, but something that was more or less the same as that. He said, there's no way this is going to be exciting for the audience. Uh, and he said, I have had the uh, team at Double Negative change the shape of the wormhole. And I had given them the equations that they could use for wormholes of many different shapes. And so they tried sh wormholes that were long and thin, short and fat, uh, all many different shapes. And he, so he showed me a se sequence of movies and none of them were really uh, what he wanted. And he said, okay, so what do we do? And I said, okay, uh, you use some artistic license. Uh, we had agreed that, so as far as it didn't get in the way of making a great movie, that uh, you would stick with the science. This was the one place where there was a major compromise. And so what they did, what he did, was he had the team at Double Negative combine the trips from various uh, shapes of wormholes together with some artistic license, some ideas from their own brains to make the trip that you, I will now show you. Now this trip that you're going to see is perfectly what you would see in the real world until Cooper pushes the joystick to enter the wormhole and at that point it's changed. So the first something like 20 seconds are the real thing and then they, we move into the artistic license. So this is the worm this is the wormhole here. Yeah.
So as I say, that's the only major compromise with the science in the entire film, though there were a lot of minor ones, and I'll tell you a secret. If you go get my book, you can uh, get it online. It's probably the easiest way. Uh, and, uh, at uh, iTunes or from uh, on a Kindle or whatever. Uh, in the back, you go to the subject index and look up a person in the subject. This is, I, I love to do this in books that I write. It's deeply hidden. But you go to the subject index and then look up Christopher Nolan. Then under Christopher Nolan, you look and you'll find an entry, compromises that he made with the science in order to make a great film. And you'll find a list of all the relevant pages of all the compromises I'm aware of. But as I say, this is the only major compromise. So, do wormholes really exist in our universe? Probably not, and that's unfortunate. But we don't know for sure. The problem is that the walls of the wormhole attract each other, and so if you don't do something to prevent them from imploding, they will implode, the wormhole will pinch off before you've had a chance to travel through it. So the issue is how do you hold a wormhole open? The answer is you have to have something that repels gravitationally to hold the wormhole open. The only thing that can repel gravitationally is something that has negative mass or negative energy. Now, you might say right away, okay, well, that's obviously you can't have such a thing, but that's not true. Uh, just like you can borrow money from the bank if your credit's good enough. One region of space can borrow energy from another region of space when at the beginning neither of them had any energy. It can do it by virtue of something called vacuum fluctuations, which are part of quantum physics, and I don't want to go into the details. But uh, this region can borrow energy from that region. It gets borrowed. That one is left with negative energy. And this is done, in fact, every day it's done in laboratories of physicists. Tiny, tiny amounts of negative energy are made in laboratories, uh, particularly using what is called squeezed light or squeezed vacuum. This is sophisticated stuff in, in, opti in modern optics. But there seems to be a fundamental principle that says the more energy you borrow, the quicker you have to pay it back. And uh, so you can't borrow enough energy and hold it long enough that you have, are able to have enough negative energy inside the wormhole to hold it open. And so I realized that that was likely the case uh, way back in the uh, late 1980s when I and others began to think about this. But despite great efforts by a number of th theoretical physicists using the laws of physics to try to figure this out. Nobody has been able to prove that this is true. So people have worked for about 25 years, some of the best theoretical physicists, and they have not managed to prove that wormholes are impossible. So they're fair game for a science fiction movie, and they're an interesting thing to talk about with an audience like you are, uh, about an example of speculative things uh, that are just beyond the boundary of our knowledge, but that might be true, but probably are not. And then I would like to add the uh, additional caveat that I have been proved wrong so many times over my career that when I say with high, high, pretty high confidence wormholes cannot exist, you should uh, be a little cautious about believing me. Okay. So that means wormholes are speculation, hence there's an S up here. But by contrast, black holes do exist. They are truth, so there's a T up here. What is a black hole? Well, as seen from the bulk, from the higher dimensions, from the fifth dimension, a black hole's entrance looks rather like a wormhole's entrance. But instead of coming down and flaring out and joining on to a distant part of the universe, it just goes down to a singularity, as we call it, a region inside the black hole where gravity is so strong that it would appear to destroy everything that goes in. So it's sort of like a wormhole, except you can't go through it. Uh, and it also has a surface, as you, most of you probably know, called a horizon or an event horizon. Once you go inside of there, you can't come out. And I will tell you about that in a few minutes. What does a black hole look like to an IMAX camera that is up near it? Well, this is actually, I'm going to show you a simple still uh, a uh, picture of what uh, uh, the camera sitting here n orbiting around a non-spinning black hole sees if you have a star over there. So you have a star, and there are two paths by which the light could come from the star to the camera, this path or that path. And they are both what we call extremal paths. Uh, they are the uh, shortest paths that they could go along in the vicinity of those paths. You deform them a little bit, and you get a little longer path. 
Uh, so these are natural paths for light to travel along. They're what we call geodesics in curved space time. And so the camera sees two images of that star. And this is uh, from then a computer simulation by Alain Riazuelo, an uh, astrophysicist in Paris, uh, done before we started working on the movie. And here is one image of that star, and there's the other image of the star. As you might imagine, there are actually more images. Light can come down and go around the black hole once and come back up. But there is a shadow. Anything light that tries to uh, come through the shadow gets caught in the black hole, swallowed, and is gone. So you see the shadow of the black hole there, and then you see multiple images of stars, uh, of each star around it. So here is a uh, movie of a camera, an IMAX camera, made by the team at Double Negative. Uh, by the same technique as I described, I gave them the equations and then they solved the equations to make uh, these, uh, this picture. The camera is orbiting around the black hole. This is the shadow. The shadow is quite complex on this side, much simpler on that side, because the black hole is spinning and space is being dragged by the spin of the black hole. So as the black hole spins, it drags space into a whirling motion like, uh, like water in a whirlpool. And that whirling space grabs the light and spreads it out so that, in fact, we have seen uh, in here, in this film clip, if we look closely, up to 14 different images of a single star on that side of the black hole from light that has swirled, gone around once, twice, three, four, up to, up to 13 times. Uh, and it's just interesting to watch what happens as the camera moves around the black hole. You see, occasionally, I'm going to back up and start this again. I'm going to back up again. I want to tell you, look down here. You uh, will see a pair of images of a star suddenly appear where there was no image at all. And this is caused by something that's called a caustic uh, in, the, in the geometry of, uh, of, of, the, of the surface along which the light travels. The caustic and what's called the past light film of the light. Those are fancy words. But this structure in uh, the warped space causes images of a single star to suddenly appear in pairs and then later images annihilate. So if you watch down here, you'll see uh, a pair of images there that appeared and they split apart. This one is going to annihilate against another one up here in a little while. There was another pair that was just created. So we had great fun with the computer program that uh, was uh, uh, made by the uh, visual effects team that got the Academy Award for this movie, using it to explore interesting things about imaging, images that are made by black holes. But that's not what you see in the movie, because the black hole in the movie, called Gargantua, is surrounded by a hot, bright disk of glowing matter. So this is the black hole in the movie, and it's unlike anything that's ever been seen in Hollywood before. A few astrophysicists have seen this, in their own simulations. And we see it, of course, uh, when we do our simulations to make the movie. And you ask, well, how do you possibly get an image like that? It's, there's a glowing uh, glow of light around and also a glow that goes across. And the answer is rather simple. Again, it's a bending of light by the warped space around the black hole. This, by the way, is all truth. Everything I'm telling you about black holes is truth. Um, in reality, there's a disk of hot gas that's in a narrow plane, very much like the uh, rings of Saturn. And there's an IMAX camera out here just above the plane of the disk. And a light ray from the top back of the disk goes up and it is bent by the warped space around the black hole, bent around and comes down to the camera like that. So to the camera, it looks like the top back of the disk is up here. So that explains this part of the image. That's the top back face of the disk coming up over the black hole's shadow. Similarly, a light ray from the bottom back face of the disk gets bent up, and so the camera thinks the bottom back face of the disk is down here. So that explains this piece of the image. And then a light ray from the front of the disk goes directly to the camera, and that explains the crossbar in the image. So it's all very simple but really quite beautiful. And this has actually become the iconic uh, picture of what a black hole looks like, used now a lot by astrophysicists, uh, mostly, I think, because it's, it's fixed in much of the public's mind from the movie Interstellar. Uh, 
uh, but it's sort of the iconic image of what a black hole really looks like, and so different from anything you've ever seen in any, pre any previous movie. Now, a major role is played in Interstellar by what I like to call Einstein's law of time warps. And Einstein's law of time warps, which he uh, devised, figured out in 1912 in the process of developing his general theory of relativity, says that things like to live where they age the most slowly. Isn't that where you would like to live? And gravity pulls them there. And the slower the flow of time at some location, the stronger gravity will pull. And there's a formula for that. So, for example, that means that the Earth's mass warps time, makes time slow down to the surface of the Earth, and this time warp is the thing that produces the gravity that we feel on the surface of the Earth. Such a different description of how gravity arises from the description that uh, Isaac Newton gave us. This is how revolutionary Einstein was. It's just a radically different story. In the case of the Earth, it turns out just knowing how strong gravity is on the surface of the Earth uh, you can put, plug into the formula and figure out that up at high altitudes, time is flowing more rapidly than on Earth, or it's more flowing more slowly on Earth than at high altitudes by one second in 100 years. So you don't gain very much by living on the surface of the Earth in terms of aging compared to up at high altitude. You've got one extra second of, of life uh, compared to your friend at high altitude. Uh, but that's because gravity, in astrophysical terms, is very weak on the surface of the Earth. This, is, by the way, was verified way back in 1976 to a precision of one part in 10,000 uh, by flying an atomic clock to high altitude in a rocket and then uh, telemetering, sending radio waves down that told about the ticking rate up there to be compared with an atomic clock back down at the Kennedy Space Center uh, down in Florida and verified then to very high accuracy. Uh, but near a black hole, such as Gargantua, gravity is enormously stronger, and so the slowing of time is enormously greater. So in particular, in the film, there's a planet called Miller's Planet that's quite close to the uh, horizon of Gargantua, quite close to its surface. And Christopher Nolan said to me early on in our discussions for this film, he said, I want it to be that on Miller's Planet, one hour there is seven years on Earth. And I told him, I don't think that's possible. I don't think light general relativity allows that much slowing of time. He said to me, go do a real calculation and let's see. Because I had told him things I thought were uh, true or not true before, and I had pr proved myself wrong a few times. So he knew how fallible I was. So I went off and I did a real calculation, and I found, well, that is possible under certain conditions. And so what's the story? This is a picture of the shape of a space uh, for a black hole, this is the bulk out here. That's our membrane, or the brain, uh, of our universe. And it bends down, as I've shown you before, near the surface of the black hole. The color coding is the slowing of time relative to time at very high altitude. And, for example, down here where it's yellow, time is flowing at 10% of the rate what it, that it is far away. Uh, and down where it's black, time is slowed to a halt and therefore gravity is infinitely strong, and that's why nothing can get out of a black hole, that uh, gravity is infinitely strong and time slows to a halt there. You might ask, well, what happens inside the black hole? What is slower than stopped time? And the answer is that inside the black hole, time flows in a direction you would have thought was a space direction. It flows downward toward an ultimate fate at what we call a singularity inside the black hole. I'll return to that in a moment. But we have the horizon here, and then we have, as I had expected uh, when I, we dis I discussed this with Chris, uh, that Miller's planet, the closest it could be to this black hole's horizon, without being pulled in, the, uh, the innermost stable circular orbit around the black hole is up here, where the slowing is uh, such that one hour on the planet is uh, 90 minutes on Earth. That's not much slowing. And that's what I expected. But then I went in and I did the calculation for a fast-spinning black hole. I discovered something very different. The fast-spinning black hole drags space into whirling motion. The angular velocity of the whirl of space is proportional to the length of these uh, white arrows. And that whirling motion is then very fast near the horizon. It's much slower farther away, very much like the air in our tornado that whirls around fast near the core and more slowly at uh, large distances. 
But the whirl of space stabilizes the planetary orbit. The, and, and so it does turn out that if black hole spins fast enough, one hour on Miller's planet can be seven years back on Earth. And so uh, I was quite wrong. And when the movie first came out, there were a number of pundits who wrote blogs or articles in newspapers about the errors in interstellar. And this is one of the errors. It's not possible to have this. And then they found out about my, about my book. They went and read about the book. And uh, I showed that uh, for fast spinning black hole, it is possible. So, so the bloggers and the pundits made the same mistake as I did. Uh, and so Chris and I were off and running. And we were able to do this. And this does play a big role in the movie because, as I, those of you who have seen the movie know, uh, Cooper, played by Matthew McConaughey, shows his daughter his watch and discusses with her that he's likely on his trip to go near a black hole and time then will slow down for him and it might even slow down so much for him that when he comes back, she might have grown to be as old as he is now and he might have aged only a very small amount. So he forewarns her of this. And it happens, uh, he goes down near a black hole, and uh, he's down there for a few hours, uh, down on the surface of Miller's planet, this near a black hole. When he comes back, then his daughter is 21 years older, and he's only three hours older. And she has become a brilliant theoretical physicist trying to understand gravity. And then he goes down near the black hole, actually it turns out inside the black hole, uh, toward the end of the movie, and he's there long enough that his daughter becomes very, very old, and he goes back and sees her at the end of the movie in a very emotional scene. So Chris made this law of time warps play a very deep role in the movie, and audiences around the world now really have some sense of the power of the slowing of time near a black hole. And that's all truth, as I say. Another piece of truth is there are on the Miller's planet, there are water waves that are one kilometer high. I'm going to show you again a film clip of this. How long for the engine's case? A minute or two. Oh, we don't have it. Come us on! Brand, Copilot, you're up. Case, blow the cabin oxygen through the main thrusters. We're going to spark it. Roger that. Max! Depressurizing! <laughs> So the question is, how could you possibly get a water wave that is uh, roughly a kilometer high? And uh, the answer is what is called tidal gravity that is the same kind of a force as produces the uh, tides on the uh, surface of the Earth. Miller's planet is near the horizon of the black hole, and gravity is stronger on this side of the planet because it's closer to the uh, horizon than on that side of the planet. And so gravity actually distorts the whole planet rather substantially because tidal gravity there is quite strong. Uh, and uh, then uh, the planet in this movie, one concludes, basically from all the data that you have from the movie, if, if you're a physicist and know about tidal gravity, the planet, unlike the moon, doesn't have one face locked always pointing toward the black hole, just as, whereas the moon has one face always pointing toward Earth. It's the tidal gravity that has made that happen with the moon. In the case of Miller's planet, the planet has only been there for a short time, as seen by the planet. That may have been a long time as seen by somebody far away because of the slowing of time. But as seen by the planet, it's only been there a short time. And so it is settling down into its uh, uh, equilibrium state. And it's rocking back and forth under the force of tidal gravity, a so-called restoring force of tidal gravity. And as it rocks back and forth, the oceans on the surface of the planet slosh back and forth. And this is the analog of what's called a tidal bore on the Earth on uh, some rivers on the surface of the Earth, when the tides that are very near the ocean and very flat, when the tides rise, a wall of water goes rushing up the river. And that's what is happening here. It's a variant of that, the sloshing. But it's actually produced, because you know, because these waves don't break, it's produced what's called a solitary wave. 
in order for this, now I'm getting a little bit technical, but there, there are uh, oceanographers here, uh, experts in these kinds of things here. Uh, it's a solitary way, but that requires that almost everywhere, but not where they have landed their spacecraft, almost everywhere the water is quite deep. It's at least a kilometer deep. But they happen to have landed on the top of a slightly submerged mountain. And this wave from the sloshing that is produced by the uh, sw swinging of the planet back and forth uh, is coming at them. And you, there are actually two waves. They're separated by a time of one hour. And it turns out when you do a calculation using the laws of tidal gravity of the sloshing period or the swinging period for this planet to swing back and forth, it's a period of one hour. And so the numbers all fit. But then in order for the numbers to fit, you have to have a black hole of a certain size, 100 million times the mass of the sun. So that's a big black hole. It turns out this, that's the same size of black hole as exists at the center of the Andromeda galaxy, which is the nearest large galaxy to our own, 100 million solar masses. And the circumference of Gargantua is about the same as the circumference of the Earth's orbit. And then everything hangs together. The numbers all come out uh, just right. Now, in the uh, original treatment that we wrote, and in uh, Jonah Nolan's screenplay, gravitational waves played a major role. They played a role in the prologue of the screenplay uh, in the sense of how was the wormhole first discovered by the people on Earth uh, looking up in the sky. It's back up there. The mouth of the wormhole is in orbit around Saturn. How was it discovered? It was discovered in, the, uh, in uh, our treatment and in the early drafts of the screenplay because there was a neutron star, a star that has about uh, a, a diameter of about uh, 20 kilometers and a mass as heavy as the sun, very dense, orbiting around a black hole and as it orbited it produced gravitational waves that went traveling out and they went down through the wormhole and came to Earth and were discovered by an instrument called LIGO, the gravitational wave project that, uh, that I co-founded. Uh, and so the people on Earth then were able to triangulate on where is the location of the source of these waves, and the location of the source of the waves appeared to be in orbit around Saturn, and that was utterly impossible. The only possible explanation was that the waves were coming through a wormhole. So that was the prologue. Chris looked at that, and he said, we don't need gravitational waves anywhere in the movie. This has got to go. Uh, because there was already too much science in the movie. And so it went, and it broke my heart, but I had to agree uh, that it had to go. Reason, one reason it uh, broke my heart, the death of the prologue, is that I was a co-founder of this project. And in this project, we are monitor, look, looking for gravitational waves, these ripples in the fabric of space and time, produced by colliding black holes or by black holes tearing apart neutron stars. When the waves come along, they push mirrors back and forth that are hanging from overhead supports. So these mirrors are stretched apart by the tidal forces of the gravitational waves arriving from the distant universe. While those are pushed together, we use a technique I won't go into called laser interferometry, but basically laser beams to monitor the stretching and squeezing of the distance between the mirrors. I just have to tell you that the distance, the amount of motion is one one thousandth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom, one one thousandth the size of a proton. And a superb experimental team has managed to build the uh, technology, develop the technology, and build a robust instrument that can measure that with a noise that is down at the level of one ten thousandth the nucleus of an atom. They're operating at a level of sensitivity where the front face of that mirror, center of mass of motion of that mirror, behaves quantum mechanically, not according to the laws of classical physics. So for the first time in human history, we see a human-sized object, subject of fluctuations that we've seen in atoms and molecules, but never seen in human-sized uh, objects before. And so the, the technology of LIGO is built to deal with that. Uh, LIGO uh, is a collaboration of uh, roughly 900 scientists, 75 institutions, and 15 nations uh, headquartered at Caltech. This is one of the instruments in Hanford, Washington. Uh, there, uh, we have two, one in Hanford, Washington, the other in Livingston, Louisiana, in North America. We have a test bed instrument in Hanover, Germany. A, uh, the Italians and French have built one in Pisa, Italy, that is not yet operational in, in, with these advanced detectors that we're now operating. 
and there are, is one under construction in Japan and one planned for India. So a worldwide network of these instruments. We need that in order to be confident that anything we see is real. We need to see the same thing in all these instruments in order to see the direction of the source by, as we say, triangulating on it by the uh, time of arrival of the signals at different locations on Earth. We began operating the advanced instruments in here uh, in September, and our first gravity wave search ended last Monday. And the team is now analyzing the data. There are rumors all over the web that we have seen gravitational waves. Uh, and all I can say is that we are still analyzing the data. We don't know. And uh, we will let the world know when the data analysis is finished. Um, but it's a very exciting time. And it was the idea of having this be part of interstellar that uh, drove me to want to have it in there. We have sensitivities good enough to see colliding back black holes a tenth of the way to the edge of the observable universe. And in a, another several years, we will see four times farther than that. So this is an incredible tour de force on the part of the experimental team. And uh, with this instrument, we're likely to see lots of colliding black holes and neutron stars and many other sources. So this is an exciting time. So I've obviously broken away from the movie because I'm telling you about something that was in the movie and is now gone but it's near and dear to my heart, and I will now return to the movie and finish the story of the movie. Uh, so a huge role is played in the movie by gravitational anomalies. An anomaly is something that is not in accord with the laws of nature as we understand them. And you see a gravitational anomaly when Cooper uh, is in his daughter's room. There's been a big dust storm, and the dust has fallen to the floor and not fallen in a uniform distribution of the over the floor, but rather fallen in strips, somehow in strips. And you watch him throw a coin in the air, and he does this many times, but just once in the movie, and the coin always lands on one of those strips of dust, never in between. So there it is, landed on a strip of dust, and it happens over and over again, and he says it's gravity. There's some strange gravitational anomaly. The pull of gravity has been changed on the floor there, so it's stronger along that strip, weaker between the strips. Nobody's ever seen anything like that before. And it just started happening a few years earlier. And that tells uh, Professor Brand and now the grown-up Murphy Cooper that perhaps there is some way to control gravity uh, in order to solve the crisis of what's happening to human beings on Earth. So they struggle to understand these anomalies because they want to be able to save humanity from a dying Earth. How? By building large uh, space stations uh, or co space colonies in large cylindrical uh, containers, building them on the surface of the Earth, and then because they don't have the rocket power to lift them off the Earth to carry the remaining inhabitants of Earth, roughly, uh, roughly one million people is all that's left on Earth again at that time. Uh, the only way they can lift them off Earth is to turn the strength of gravity down. So this is getting very speculative. There's a great big S up here. Uh, but this is something that is conceivable in uh, a situation where you have the fifth dimension. And, in fact, the mathematics about how it might come about is on uh, Professor Brand's blackboard. There are 16 blackboards, and you see get glimpses of these blackboards in the movie, that spell out the mathematics using the laws of physics in the fifth dimension, how this might come about. Uh, speculative, uh, but not impossible. Uh, and then Murph concludes that half of the answer to how to control gravity due to the gravitational anomalies is contained here, but there's a missing half that is the only place to find it is inside Gargantua. And I'll explain why it's inside Gargantua that they have to go to get this information. So Cooper plunges into Gargantua near the end of the movie, going after the missing information. And it's interesting to watch his plunge. So that's his uh, craft heading down. Now you're in the craft looking out. And nosing down. Approaching the event horizon. Approaching the event horizon. Which side? He's Dependent inside the black hole. And then you look up above, and you see the universe. The external universe is up here. The accretion disk is surrounding the external universe. 
Of course, before the external universe surrounded the accretion disk with the black hole in the inside, but it's all been inverted when he went inside the black hole. You cannot see into a black hole, but if you're in there, you can see out, obviously, because light can fall in and come to your eyes. But if you're on the outside, light can't come out. And so it's really a beautiful, to, for me, it was a beautiful image to see made by solving Einstein's equations uh, of the uh, accretion disk is, and the external universe is seen from inside the uh, black hole. Now, going back to viewing this uh, from the bulk, from the higher dimension, I'm coming near the end now, uh, uh, as seen by some sort of beings that live outside in that bulk, looking in, here is the uh, black hole's uh, space, of our universe, uh, the warped space around the black hole before the external universe is up here, going flat up here. The horizon, the point of no return, the place where uh, the pull of gravity becomes infinitely strong and uh, nothing can get out is up here. Down inside there is something that, this is my own artist's conception, uh, the best I could do to describe a very chaotic singularity, anything that falls in there gets stretched and squeezed violently and, de and destroyed. And the atoms of which your body are made, uh, is made, if you fall in there, they then get stretched and squeezed and destroyed in this singularity. This is truth. There's a big T up here. And we understand at least what general relativity says about the uh, singularities. But the core of the singularity is governed by a set of physical laws that we don't understand. They're the laws that are obtained by combining the laws of quantum physics with Einstein's relativity theory. There's the so-called laws of quantum gravity. And if uh, Cooper can collect the information from observing this singularity, of the, about the laws of quantum gravity and send that back to uh, his daughter and Professor Brand, they can use that to figure out the missing in information. That's an aspect of gravity that we've never understood and that, uh, Murph concludes, is really what uh, she is missing. And so the goal then is to go down and collect the laws, uh, learn about the laws of quantum gravity and send the information back. Of course, there are two problems with this. First uh, is that uh, you die. And the, and the second is you can't send any information out of a black hole. Fortunately, just before uh, the, we started work on this movie, theoretical physicists discovered by solving Einstein's equations there's more than one singularity inside a black hole. There are two gentle singularities whose origin I will let you go read about in my book. I won't go into the details. Uh, and they are much more gentle and uh, Cooper falling in, gets trapped between these two singularities and uh, then gets caught by the outlying singularity. And that's a place where these tidal forces, they get very strong very quickly and they are then controlled by the laws of quantum gravity, but it is so quick that his body doesn't have enough time to respond and for him to die. And so he might survive, but how does he get the information out? Well, now this gets very speculative. There should be a giant S up here. But bulk beings, a very advanced civilization that lives in the fifth dimension, have built a vehicle called a tesseract and placed it there. They've been helping humanity all the time. And throughout the movie, you have references to they, and the they, and it's referred to many times in the movie, they, they, they. And at one location, you will hear the phrase bulk beings for, 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 and to explain who the they are. And that's Christopher Nolan. He will tell you in one place in the movie who they are, uh, if you know what the bulk is and what a bulk being is. Anyway, so these beings that live in the higher dimension, they scoop Cooper up in this vehicle called the Tesseract. The Tesseract is a four-dimensional cube. Uh, so if you had take an ordinary cube with three dimensions and you go up close to this face and look into it, you see those surrounding faces on the outside like that, and there's the back face. So that's what a cube looks like up close. The same way a four-dimensional cube or a tesseract looks like a cube inside a cube. But there are uh, the surfaces of, uh, just as the surfaces of an ordinary cube are planes, the surface of a tesseract, the surfaces are three-dimensional cubes. Uh, and so here's Cooper floating in one surface of this tesseract. And the Tesseract carries him through the bulk above our universe. The universe is down there. He's lifted into the bulk, carried 
a distance that is really quite short through the bulk, but very long through our universe. And this is all based on the mathematics of general relativity uh, in a fifth dimension, that this is a very short distance, is carried very quickly back to Earth through the bulk, where the Tesseract docks alongside his daughter's bedroom, his farmhouse. And uh, the ending of the movie occurs then in the Tesseract with his daughter in one face inside uh, her room, uh, Cooper in the other face, uh, the, uh, uh, our universe, her room uh, in here is up on that side, and he's out in the bulk in this other face. And he can look at her looking up and see the top of her head by light that goes through this face, then that face, and down. Uh, it's coming from her head. Looking down, he sees her feet. Looking to the side, he sees her from the side. Looking from this side, he sees her from the side. So to him, it looks like he's surrounded by six different images of his daughter. It looks to him like he's floating in here, and there's his daughter. On all sides of him, there are images of his daughter. Now, this is what a tesseract would really do, and it was Christopher Nolan's idea to use a tesseract. I suggested he put Cooper on the surface of a four-dimensional sphere. He said, no, tesseracts are more interesting. And so the tesseract was his idea. And, uh, but then he said, I'm going to make the room in which Cooper, uh, or the face in which Cooper is uh, living uh, larger and uh, compared to uh, the face in which, uh, in, in which his daughter is the face that's in her room. So it now looks like he's in this big void and there are instances of her room around him. And then he says, I'm going to add on a whole series of images of her room. With each image displaced in time by a very small amount so that if Cooper travels up through there from room to room, he can go forward or backward in time. And it's possible to design a tesseract in the fifth dimension that, where this would be, uh, would be true. This is a vehicle that has been built by the bulk beings and it has this strange property. He can travel forward and backward in time relative to his daughter by going in space in this complex tesseract. So here you see Cooper floating uh, inside uh, his face of the tesseract. Those are three different faces with three different instances of his daughter. You're just seeing the back of the bookshelves of her room uh, there. Now I'm going to show you a film clip that those of you who have seen the movie, it'll be familiar to you, that shows him in agony right after he has arrived, very, very puzzled, uh, lost, uh, in despair, can't figure out what's going on, just totally disoriented. If you look, you can see in multiple instances of his daughter in the background. And it goes on and on. So if you don't read my book, you have no idea that this is what's going on. <laughs> and uh, so early on in our second or third mo meeting, Chris said to me, he said, I want this movie to have an ending that is just as puzzling as the ending of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, but an ending that can be explained. And then when I got to sit down to write my book, he said, I'll let you do the explanation. And then, so we had long arguments and discussions over what was going on inside the Tesseract until we ultimately had an agreement of what's really behind what you see. And this is a piece of it. The rest is discussed in my book. But a key part of this is that Cooper then, he's, uh, he, with the help of the robot TARS, he has collected the missing quantum data uh, quant about quantum gravity. He sends it uh, back to his daughter uh, by means of Morse code, pushing on something called an extrusion, though that word's not used in the movie. Uh, and uh, that push, he pushes it, it sends a gravitational force from his face of the Tesseract through the interior, which is four, has four space dimensions, to his daughter, where it pushes on the second hand of a watch and sends a Morse encoded uh, information about the laws of quantum gravity to her. There's one peculiarity about this, however. Uh, when he's pushing on that uh, extrusion, he's been near the black hole twice, and so his daughter is an old man, and when she receives the information, she's a 30-year-old uh, theoretical physicist. And so the information has gone backward in time 
but backward in earth time. And in the last appendix, more or less the last page of my book, there's a discussion of how that's possible, that a signal going through the bulk, but only going through the bulk, not going any, any, any other way, can go forward in time inside the bulk, but backward in time relative to time on Earth. And this is one of the weird things in general relativity, that you can have time so twisted up that you can go forward in time relative to where you are, but possibly backward in time relative to what's going on somewhere else. The information then uh, is received by, uh, by his daughter. Uh, that's the missing information. And the back story then is that uh, she then puts the, all the information together, learns how to control gravity, and uh, what the dream that she and uh, Brand, Professor Brandon had comes true. They turn the gravity down on the Earth uh, long enough to lift colonies into space. And at the end of the movie, you see Cooper inside one of these colonies, ha having returned and been rescued uh, at the end of the film. Uh, so that's the story. That's the, the back story on the Tesseract part. To get the full details, you have to read my book. Uh, but, uh, but it is one of the most puzzling uh, endings for a movie that I've ever kn known. And I don't know anybody who's figured it out uh, without either talking to Christopher Nolan uh, or, or reading my book. And so, ex except you, I've told you. So where to from here, from a personal point of view? Well, I'm working on a treatment for a second movie. I won't tell you what the name of the movie is, because that would give it away. I won't tell you what uh, the science is in the movie. That would give you it away. I'll tell you it's a different set of science than in Interstellar. But we've gone through nine drafts of a treatment. The people working on this treatment are Linda Opes, me, and Stephen Hawking. So it's a collaboration among the three of us. And uh, Linda and I have our first meeting with a studio executive, the CEO of... Uh, of DreamWorks Studios, uh, Steven Spielberg Studio, so we may wind up with Spielberg again, as, at least in the creative phase of this film, if it goes forward. Uh, we have our first meeting with him in the first week of February. So it's fun, I'm enjoying it, and we, it has been just wonderful to be able to have this fun and at the same time convey some of the excitement of science to an enormous audience throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kip. I think it was remarkable. You know, uh, I hope you appreciate the love that this person has for, for science and what he has done for science and the communication of, of science at this level through the remark tonight. I also hope that all of you appreciate that you can go home and call your, your friends, your family, and tell them that tonight at Chaos you have been through a wormhole a black hole, a stesseract, that you know everything there is to know about general relativity, or close enough you will buy the book to, to, to know the rest. <laughs> Finally, there is one remark that uh, Kip made during his uh, beginning of his talk where he said that you know, the, more, the, the more energy you borrow in, 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 in the universe, the quicker you are supposed to repay it. And it tells you that uh, governments and banks don't follow the law of physics. <laughs> <laughs> so all this being said, I hope you appreciate the evening. I think we have time for a few questions. So please, if you want to ask questions, now is the time. We have a few mics here and there. So raise your hand. There are a couple of them right here. On, on your right here, right here. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I have the following question. When Cooper transferred data to MIRF uh, from this Tesseract, what kind of data he transfers and like so, what time it takes for him to transfer them in binary? Because I think it's like very verbose way of yeah, so it may for be human beings. Well, let me back up. What he needs to transfer to her are the fundamental principles of the laws of quantum gravity in five dimensions. Now, we don't know the laws of quantum gravity in four dimensions, 
So this goes beyond the struggle that people are doing. On the other hand, well, I should back off and say, the best approach to these laws of quantum gravity is something called string theory, which only works in 10 or 11 dimensions. And so he's just working with five, and uh, the other dimensions are going along for a free ride. So anyway, what he needs is the laws of quantum gravity, and, uh, and those may be expressible, perhaps, in a fairly simple form. The laws of general relativity are expressible in a quite a simple form, once you know the appropriate mathematical language. Uh, and so that's what he transfers to her. What she then needs to do, I'll tell you if I get slightly technical, is take a so-called classical limit and identify the so-called effective uh, 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 action that underlies uh, uh, the uh, classical laws of physics, for, uh, uh, which is what she needs to control gravity. Uh, and uh, so there's a mathematical procedure that she follows in order to get, to, uh, to get what she needs. And in the end, what she needs is one equation, and that's what's emphasized throughout the, uh, the movie, is the missing equation that, uh, that Professor Brand is looking for. And the missing equation is the so-called classical limit for the, uh, for the classical limit of the quantum effective action uh, of uh, quantum gravity in five dimensions. Now, that's a mouthful. Uh, uh, but uh, there is underlying science, well-defined underlying science, and it can be something that is uh, relatively short, perhaps, just depending on what the nature of those quantum laws are. There is one over there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, uh, when, the, when Cooper goes into the event horizon, the process of spaghettification won't occur because the black hole is that massive, right? That's right. So, okay. so and, but it, still, it doesn't discount the fact that he would die because he, uh, from Cooper's view, he's moving infinite and the universe is coming up blue shifted. Uh, so Cooper has fallen, fallen into the black hole. First, let me explain. There's a very technical uh, phrase that we use in the laws of physics, the laws of tidal gravity. It's called spaghettification. And it comes from the English word spaghetti or the Italian word spaghetti. And uh, it's when uh, tidal forces become so strong that you uh, turn a human being into a tube of spaghetti. You, you stretch the human being apart. And if a black hole is as heavy as I said, that's why I said the black hole has to be 100 million times heavier than uh, uh, the sun. For that size black hole, sp the spaghettification forces, the tidal forces, are weak enough that Cooper doesn't feel them very much as he goes into the horizon. But they become very strong extremely quickly as he hits this so-called upflying singularity inside the black hole. But they become strong so quickly that although the force that's trying to stretch him becomes infinite, it becomes infinite so quickly that uh, the, uh, net, the total amount of force is f of stretching is finite. Uh, it's if, if you get hit very quickly, uh, if you're hit quickly enough, then uh, you don't necessarily get a huge net impact if, if, the, if the hit is sufficiently quick. And so uh, you, he does not get spaghettified, but the spacecraft in which he's riding, uh, which is called the Ranger spa spacecraft, does get torn apart by the tidal forces. So if you look carefully, go, go get a DVD or a Blu-ray, and you look, there's a very brief glimpse as he enters the Tesseract, looking back, or just before he enters the Tesseract, a very brief glimpse of uh, the, the spacecraft he was in, the Ranger, torn apart. And just before that, you hear a computer voice saying, eject, 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 because the computer knows that the, tes that the Ranger is going to be torn apart by sp spaghettification. Okay, over there. Um, is there any way of replicating high gravity environments that we know of or are hoping to discover today? And if so, would there be any way of actually gaining data from that? So uh, there are different, the word gravity has several different meanings. The, the, kind, the gravity that we usually think about is the kind of gravity that holds us to the surface of the earth. But that is really basically the same thing as you feel in a centrifuge. If you're, or if, you, if, you're, uh, if uh, your 
in a centrifuge as you have at some amusement parks and it's going around and around, you can be pushed to the walls by centrifugal forces. That centrifugal force is the same kind of a, an acceleration as you feel from the surface of the Earth. The difference is in the tidal gravity, which is how the strength of the gravity changes when you go from one location to another. And that is the thing that is tied to the warping of time and space uh, most intimately. Uh, so the whole thing is a little bit complicated. So then let me say that a very strong tidal gravity is not something that we have the technology to produce. Uh, we can alter tidal gravity a little bit by putting a bunch of masses around, around you. Uh, uh, put uh, uh, some mass above your head that, it, that pulls uh, up in that direction a little bit or off to the side. It will change the tidal gravity. We don't have the technology to change that very much, but we can change the overall strength of a, of, of a pull that you feel locally, for example, in a centrifuge. The tidal gravity is the thing that is most intimately tied to the warping of space and time. And uh, that's to say we don't have the technology to produce very much of warping of space and time today. The bulk beings do in this movie. <laughs> one question over there. I, uh, I have two quick questions. Just only, only one. Only one then. The, uh, when Cooper goes into the wormhole with TARS, they're talking about the bulk beings. And then he comes to the realization that the bulk beings are actually them. When he tells them, don't you see it's actually us? And I don't know what the, the philosophical implication from the directors in there, but yeah. what did he exactly mean with that? Okay, so, so what he says, Cooper says, don't you realize, he says to Tars, that the bulk beings are really our descendants, basically. It's us in the fu distant future, that humans have evolved uh, so much that they evolved uh, so that they have been able to move out and spread not just through the universe, but into the bulk. Um, obviously, this is extreme speculation. There are a number of spots in the movie where the characters say things that are not true. And Chris knows that. We discussed it. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, these things are said. Uh, the characters are, fa are fallible. And that's one of the things that is a challenge for the audience. When you he hear the characters making some pronouncements such as this, is it really true or is it not true? There are arguments uh, between Cooper and Brand over issues, and they can't both be correct, Cooper and, Br and Brand. And so uh, this is one that I'm very skeptical of, but we won't know whether that's really true or not until Chris makes a sequel, if he makes a sequel. So for now, it's something that's in, is in, in Chris's mind that that could be, and perhaps it will turn out to be the case in, in a sequel. One last question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. When Cooper, Where are you? Uh, here, actually. <laughs> okay. right. When Cooper was inside the black hole, he was mentioning about a method of communication which was loud. So was that your idea or Nolan's idea? And would you put T or S on it? So, so when Cooper is in, inside the black hole, you mean his co communication with Murph? Yeah, he was saying that the method I'm going to use is, is the love, you know? Oh, oh love, okay. Um, if you look in my book, <laughs> The Science of Interstellar, and you look up in the index where you'll find de indexed all of the science ideas that are in the movie, you will not find the word love. <laughs> so that tells you the answer. It's, it's an, again, it's an idea, an idea that is proposed by Brand an idea that is culturally a very powerful idea in some cultures uh, uh, and has, I think, played a big role in the popularity of this film in China, for example. It may, it may have played a big role there. Um, it was the central thing that, uh, who's the conservative columnist for the New York Times? Uh, Brooks? Brooks. Brooks. David Brooks. David Brooks. Uh, wrote, a, wrote a column about Interstellar, and that's what he focused on, uh, because that's what resonated with him. So it plays an important role in reaching certain pieces of the audience, such as David Brooks. Uh, but uh, the word love does not appear in, in my book. You know, there is um, a, clo uh, a close friend of mine and a person that Kip Thorne knows very well, too, a distinguished engineer called Paul Jennings, who 
who was the provost of Caltech a number of years ago. And Paul told me one day that every time he listens to Kip Thorne, uh, he's not sure where the S stops, where the T stops and the S starts, <laughs> or in, in Paul Jennings' words, where science and, and science fiction starts. But in any way, he said, it's always beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have, a, we have a small token of appreciation. You know, the, uh, the emblem of chaos is a beacon, a big beacon of hope. You are represent a beacon of science, so it is a, a model of the beacon of chaos. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, that means Let me just say before we all leave how very impressed I am by KAUST, uh, what I've learned of this institution, of uh, what it is beginning to achieve, the dreams that it is very likely to achieve. This is an absolutely unique institution in the whole world, which uh, has the possibility to have a huge impact, not just in Saudi Arabia, but around the world. And I congratulate you all in being uh, a part of such an important endeavor. <laughs>